So after six months of planning and changing and tweaking and then watching a lot of local football over the last six months, I thought, right, it is now time to share my tactical blueprint on the channel. So in today's video, we're going to go through everything, all the principles of play of in and out of possession, counter attacks, counter defense, even a little look at set pieces, how we will build up, how we will press and how it all fits in with football manager, in particular, the tactic, the shape, everything will be available down for my patrons as a tactical download, but how it is linked together with real life football and then FM24. So today's video is going to be a big one, guys. So I really appreciate if you smash a like on today's video. There's a little competition going running over on Twitter as well. So go check that out if you want to get your hands on a free football shirt. And let me know down in the comments, what's your perfect style? You know, would you like to play the Pep Guardiola sort of like positional play? Would it be more heavy metal gig and pressing of a Jurgen Klopp? Would it be the pragmatism of Mourinho? Would it be a classic Brian Club 442? Let me know your manager style down in the comments. So what is my tactical blueprint? Well, basically, it's how I'm going to want to play with a team if I go back into football managing in sort of like the local area. Eight years now without without being part of it. And I'm kind of always missed it, but it's getting to the point now where we may be able to dive back into it over the next six to 12 months. So for people that don't know, I started coaching as a 16 year old, sort of like managing a couple of local junior football teams. And then at the age of 19, I think it was 2005, I then started managing my men's team, which I'd only been playing for for about a year. I managed to break my back in the October of that season. And that kind of pushed me even more towards not really playing and concentrating on coaching. And then over the next eight years, managing in my local team, it was all mates, it was sort of like beer, football and mates. It was an absolutely brilliant time. However, in 2013, when I started working in my current job where we have this brilliant, fantastic new 3G pitch, I decided to merge my men's team with a local struggling junior team and merging them together to create hopefully like a local player pathway. If you're familiar with my videos on the channel, I always talk about a player pathway from sort of like 19s to a B team to the first team, like I'm what I'm doing currently in my Malaga save on the channel. And I wanted to create that now at the time I was co coaching three-year-olds, I was coaching junior juniors and I was coaching seniors. So the idea was that I brought them all together so there was a local player pathway for children to progress all the way through from men's and then even to vets. Really successful period. We managed to get promoted. <laughs> into the York Premier Division, which if you download the like the FM editor's long league database, they're actually a playable league. So that was pretty cool. Beating our rivals 3-2, I think with two games to go at their place to secure promotion was pretty special. Over that three-year period as well, I think we grew the club from like eight junior teams to 20 junior teams, three men's teams, a women's team and a veterans team. Really successful period. I won a couple of awards as well, which was pretty cool. And then it kind of just got to the point where it completely burnt out. It was relentless. Ralphie came along and he decided to take a step back with kind of the hope that I would step back into football managing at some point and then life gets in the way. I'm now working permanently on Saturdays and it makes it a little bit of an issue. However, due to kind of the success of the channel that I started in 2018, it's now got to the point where I've kind of paid off a lot of the debts that I kind of had and there's a bit more free money kicking around and I've got a decision to make whether I drop my hours at work in order for me then to manage a local football team again. And I thought, right, if I'm going to dive into it this time, what would I do differently? I've got a few non-negotiables as well. I don't want to dive back in and it being that like local kind of Sunday league vibe. I really want to give it some sort of like care and attention, obviously due to the channel and all the data available and sort of like the tactical geeks over on Twitter and stuff. I've kind of watched and learned and researched a lot of stuff over the last few years. So I think I'm in a better place now to, to sort of like coach and manage a football team than what I was in my sort of like my late teens and my early 20s. So what I've learned in these eight years, how would I play? Remember, we're trying to fit this to local league football. I'm not coaching Manchester City. We're going to be coaching a local league side and how we watch them and the league that they play in recently, how I think we can kind of exploit weaknesses and make us stronger in certain areas where teams are kind of kind of week, all right? So we're going to talk about the local football, the standard, the conditions that we have, how I'm going to set them up, the shape and everything. This is the blueprint. Let's go. All right, okay, so I think it's quite important to kind of give you an overview of sort of like the local football in our area. Not so much the leagues, but kind of like the standard and what I've noticed and the strengths and weaknesses, 
more weaknesses and then how we would potentially look at counteracting some of the weaknesses, some of the systems that the teams play and then how that then looks in FM. So the first thing is game of transitions. There's not so much in terms of build-up play. It's all about getting the ball forward quickly, not always long, but very quick, very high tempo. And because of the lack of kind of technical quality, possession numbers, you're looking at maybe only three, four, five pass, pass sequences before it either goes long, goes out of play, and there's a and then there's a break up in play. So a game of transition. So we need to kind of think of how are we going to deal with that when we win the ball? And then at the same time, how we deal with that when we lose the ball in particular. A lot of our stuff from this, I've kind of realised it'll be the work we do out of possession rather than in possession. I think it's going to be quite hard to build up kind of a brilliant, like Roberto De Zerbi kind of building up from the back, really patient style with the technical, but not with the, yeah, with the lack of, you know, we're comparing these to professional footballers. So the lack of technical qualities. So a lot of the things we look at, will actually be our out-of-possession principles. As I've mentioned, a poor quality in general possession, so having this slow build-up, which I can remember doing it at times. You know, the pitch that we play on and played on in the past is a 3G pitch where I work at a school that I work at. It's about to get relayed next year, so the playing surface is absolutely brilliant, but you also need those technical players. I will mention as well, it's a huge pitch, and it'll have red lines across to separate the thirds, so we can have three thirds for training. Um, the, third, the lines that run across the third are actually going to be a really useful tool for when we're pressing and having pressing triggers. But generally, yeah, passing poor quality in general possession, there's not much in your teams are often quite flat, rigid shapes. So making possession, so making possession often quite square and then losing possession pl plague often going long. So we need to think of, you know, what can the team do? We're not going to try and build out and have these really complicated patterns. We want to create some build up patterns, but it's all got to be really simple with shapes often being 4-4-2 was the most prominent, 4-3-3. And a 4-5-1. 4-5-1 one often mean teams that are really struggling. Maybe I've watched a couple of cup games when D Division 2 teams have played Division 1 teams. The Division 2 teams have just decided to do a flat 4-5-1 and leave someone up front all by themselves. And how we would deal with that, what we wouldn't do if that was a scenario when we were playing against a team that were a lot higher than us in terms of standard. There's no obvious in and out of possession structures. It's basically set a team up and off you go. There's a lot of, not so much coaching on the sidelines. It's more managing and shouting and, you know, the general, you're not talking kind of reactions and stuff. And that's no slight on all the managers that give up their time at weekends and stuff. But I think that's definitely something that we can focus on in terms of exploiting teams' weaknesses. And a lot of success teams actually get. Exploiting gaps between centre-halves and full-backs, exploiting spaces in wide, not wide areas, but down sort of like the half spaces for generally quick strikers to beat slower defenders. There's not so much in terms of really nice, pretty build-up. Crosses into the box, yes. However, I haven't seen much quality in terms of crosses into the box and headed goals, percentage-wise, is really low. One thing I have noticed as well is how even really good, not really good, but decent lone strikers at that level struggle in and out of possession when they're playing in 4-5-1s and 4-3-3s because they don't know, obviously, how to press, when to press, where to stand, how then to get support when they're holding the ball up, things like that. So that is definitely something that I've put into my tactical blueprint and something that we're not going to be playing with. We're not going to be playing with a lone striker. Interesting as well, how wide... How the wide players in a 4-4-2 and a 4-3-3 react in and out of possession, in particular 4-3-3s, when there's a, a reaction in terms of they've lost possession, amount of times they just kind of stay flat and really high. A 4-3-3 looks like a 4-3-3 where it's just spread out across the pitch. I definitely think in transitions, that's something we can exploit. We can overload. I'm going to say a little bit lazy from wide players. I would hate to say we're playing 4-3-3 today because I think that gives the opportunity for the two wide players who are normally attacking players. They then think that they can just stay out wide, not trap pack, and they're acting as a striker. So that's something we can definitely exploit. And then in a 4-4-2, the wide players kind of often hug the touchline either side, often don't tuck in and help out and support the midfield, the central midfielders. So that's going to be definitely something that we're going to look to exploit playing through the middle of the pitch, getting overloads in there when we can. And then the last one for local football, obviously very poor in terms of high pressing structures. They will often chase players down. There's players with great attitude, great engines, but it always feels like that kind of Bruno Fernandes kind of chasing when 
the rest of the team aren't backing it up and it's easy to play out. So we're going to try and exploit that. We're also going to try and make sure that our team does it. Now, it's going to be quite hard to do, you know, a really intelligent press. But I think if we have a man-to-man -man press with us not pressing 100% of the time, I think we can get the balance just right. So we're going to set out a few little pressing traps, a few pressing triggers as well. Something really basic that I still think would work at local level. Okay, so now we're going to really dive in into the principles of play. Now, there's obviously set principles of play. However, we're going to tweak that. We can't over, you know, I'm going to have the lads for what? An hour a week, potentially, maybe an hour before kickoff, an hour and a half before kickoff to kind of get things in. There'll be a, obviously a really important part of a pre-season. But generally, we're not going to be able to focus on loads of different aspects. So I think there's going to be a key aspects from each part of principles of play that we're going to try and incorporate into this team, into this setup. So there's obviously in possession, the out of possession stuff, counter attacks and counter defense for the transitions. And then the last two that I'm going to focus on at the end, just so I could show you in FM is how we set up for set pieces, attacking and defending and how I think that would work at a local level. Okay, so moving into the in-possession stuff, I think what we're gonna try and do is move the ball vertically quickly through the thirds. We're not gonna try and overplay. We want the passing to be quick. It's even kind of like a little bit of a Red Bull style. So I've been watching a lot of stuff, in particular over uh, Julian Nagelsmann's Hoffenheim before he went to the Leipzig kind of model. So we're gonna do a little bit of a hybrid between both. He was obviously high pressing, but we're going to do it a little bit differently. Obviously, everything's going to be basic. There's going to be a couple of little movements and stuff that strikers and central midfielders are going to do, holding midfielders. But generally, we're going to try and move the ball quickly through the thirds, in particular when we play it at home. The pitch that we'll be playing on is massive. It's probably the biggest pitch in the league. It's flat. It gives us the opportunity to move the ball along the floor. Obviously, we're not going to be able to break teams down with a beautiful ticky-tacker kind of positional play style. So we still have to have that direct element. The idea that we'll obviously have more pace in our strikers than what their defenders are. So we're going to try and exploit space in behind the defensive lines. And in particular, how to... Something that Nagelsmann did at Hoffenheim, where he not so much focused on dislodging the midfield line. It'll be about creating space by getting and drawing some of the defenders, in particular fullbacks, out of their positions and exploiting those little holes that fullbacks leave. We're also going to play with minimum width, um, which is something that's been talked about a lot. I think it's very important to help us with a counter-attack, in particular as well, on the big pitch. If we're completely spread out across the pitch, we're going to lose the ball. We're going to be susceptible, you know, we're going to be susceptible to counter-attacks. My worry is as well that probably the strikers on the opponent's side will be probably quicker than our defenders, regardless of who we kind of play back there. So that's going to be something that we maybe need to think about. So playing with minimum width will help us when we lose the ball. Now, short of passing, now I'm going to kind of contradict myself a little bit in the FM terms, but I don't want the passes to be too long. That means that the passes will be more difficult, more chance of them going wrong, more chance of them getting cut out. But we're looking at sort of like not short of passing for the sake of it. Remember, we're trying to move that ball vertically quickly. And really key and something that teams never really look at is having a good rest defence. Now, we have a role in this FM tactic that we can really use for that. So having a really good rest defence structure, basically good rest defence is how you're setting up defensively when your team is in possession. So if there's a counter-attack, we lose it. Are we set up to kind of stop a counter-attack at source and we're making sure we're not leaving ourselves too open for a counter-attack? Okay, so out of possession, we're going to move to a mid to high block. And I've gone for a mid to high block for two reasons. One, I've actually said the, li the lines on the 3G pitch are split into thirds. And it gives us a real basic and obvious opportunity for our team to set ourselves up and not getting caught with where they need to stand. So having that, them lines there as a little bit of a source, a starting point, gives that really good start. At the same time... I'm curious about the amount of energy that the team would have in constantly pressing. Yes, we want to put pressure on defenders, but I think if we press high, teams will generally just go along anyway. They won't try and play through a really difficult press. So I'm thinking that we may end up wasting energy by going and charging in and they'll just play along. Yes, we'll get the ball back, but nine times out of 10, teams will do that anyway. So what we're going to try and do is set up a few little pressing triggers and traps. We're going to set pressing traps to force the ball wide. So our centre halves are going to drop off quite deep. Uh, so our centre forwards are going to drop off and they're not going to press the centre halves. And we're going to try and encourage the goalkeeper to play it short. We're going to try and encourage him to play it short. And then we're going to try and force the player because of how we're set up. 
we're going to force the play wide to the fullbacks. Now, the fullbacks are interesting roles in sort of like local level. Often the weakest in terms of technical ability, they're often not strong enough to be centre halves and they're not technically, most of the time, good enough to be attacking wide players or central midfielders. You know, you do get those odd carrots and the team that potentially I would look at maybe working with, they actually have one really decent fullback. However, generally, we want to force the ball to like the Aaron Wambasaka of the team. So we're going to do that. Compactness is going to be absolutely key. A lot of the times, as I said, 4 3 threes, opponents are always spread out across the pitch and it's really easy to play through. So we're going to get in and be as compact as we can. So that'll be a mid block with kind of a high line, it, nearly like an Arrigo Saki kind of style of play where we're really condensed in the middle third of the pitch. And then when we are pressing, we're going to have this pendulum effect. We are playing with wing backs. So when, the, when we're going to encourage our wide players to really go and engage, depending on the system and the shape, we really want them to go and press. So the pendulum would work where a wing back would go out. Our centre half, because if we're going to play with three at the back, we're going to have that space in those channels. So we need to stop that. And by stopping that, we have the pendulum effect where if the left wing back goes in, the centre half moves across, the left centre half moves across to like left back, right back and the centre back move across to be a back, sort of like an, a, a back four with then the wing back dropping in and then like vice versa the other side and that will just keep us blocking spaces for those quicker centre forwards to exploit. And also I do think the pendulum effect, the way to press like that, I do think I can probably get it working at a local level. And then in transitions, one big thing, um, York City actually, the York City manager that got sacked in the summer actually spoke about it a, a lot, was... In transitions when attacking, securing the ball first. I think at times when they get it, you're counter-attacking, the first thing is to play it long and we waste the ball in possession. So what we're going to try and do is secure the ball first and how we do that is going to be interesting, trying to get a couple of maybe two or three safe passes in first and then we look to break either with a dribble. I've got my two centre midfielders, hopefully we'll be two players that can dribble and drive the ball up the pitch working with our two centre forwards to be in a position where they can get into dropping a little bit of space and hold the ball up with that first safe pass rather than looking at exploiting, you know, channels and balls over the top as soon as we win the possession of the ball. Box occupation is absolutely massive. So when we break, we break aggressively. We're going to be playing with wing backs. So making sure if the ball's on the left, the right wing backs getting in there, the two strikers, the midfielders. Obviously, we need to focus on that rest defence, but getting bodies in the box extremely important when we're transitioning. Can we break, can we overload our opponent's defence? And then in defence, our main focus will be how we react. Often when teams lose the ball, yes, you kind of get it with the person that often loses the ball. You will see that natural, you will see that natural counter press from them, but it's what the other players do how quickly they react. We want to be compact. So we're going to really focus on just a simple structure of squeezing the play and coming in really narrow. And that will help with our counter pressing because we are going to counter press. I think it's a natural thing for players to do rather than regrouping and getting shape. If you lose the ball, you want to get it back and it'll be a focus on how quickly we can get the ball back. And at the same time, can we counter press initially for those first few seconds? Can we win the ball back quickly? Can we stop a counter attack more importantly? So how would the team look? This is it. It's a 3-5-2. I'm a big fan of 3-5-2s, always have been. Like the Inzaghi tactic recently has highlighted a lot of awesome things. Now, we're not going to do that. We're not going to have roaming centre-halves. But however, I think we can use the three centre-halves in build up a little bit and to give us that kind of classic overload, obviously playing against a 4-4-2 a lot of the time, we're going to have that 3v2, 4v2 if you include a goalkeeper, I would say the goalkeeper who plays in the team that I used to manage is exceptional, with his feet, takes free kicks, takes penalties in penalty shootout, really comfortable on the ball, he's not the, he's not the fittest, he's not the fittest in terms of goalkeepers, but someone that you would definitely use, he could easily spray a ball out to a left wing back, a right wing back, and he's comfortable really progressing the ball. So something that you could, so something that we'll be really able to work on in build up. So the, so the main reason why we've gone the three five two to give us that overload in defence, it also stops those counter attacks down the channels. If we're holding three players back there. It allows our wing backs to get further forward and then we shuffle across. Obviously, if a left full back goes forward, we often find as well in teams and in what games that I've watched, when full backs go forward, the centre halves often stay really central. They don't, they sometimes bring in a right back, but they always lead gaps down the side. So that's something we're going to try and plug and we can plug it better and more quickly if we play with a three at the back. 
Also then it gives us that overload in the central area of the pitch. I've talked about the kind of the lack of quality generally with fullbacks and how they kind of play. You know, there's no Jan Cancelos, there's no Dolores coming into midfield and things like that. It is often standard, stay wide, support the centre-halves, support the wide players at times. So I think we can get around that by having an extra defender in and an extra central midfielder in. We've also spoke about delivery into the penalty area as well. So we're going to really focus on quality and going through the thirds, staying really compact. A lot of the play, build-up play comes through the thirds anyway. A lot of transitions in that middle third. And as you can see, three centre-halves, three central midfielders in there, two attackers, wing-backs tucking in when we can and making it extremely compact. The main, so the main centre-half, the middle one, will be that probably that classic centre-half that you find in local league levels, maybe potentially a little bit older. Maybe probably not as quick as some of the others. Maybe the captain, a little bit of a leader, basically in there to make sure we're nice and set. He will, he's oper he will help him build up. He will play the ball simply. We're not asking him to spray 50-yard passes. We're not potentially looking at a libero. You know, that is something that a lot of teams are doing, especially De Frey at uh, Inter often moves in. A Serbi often moves into that central area. Manchester City obviously do it a lot with their central their centre backs moving into midfield. John Stones, etc. We're not going to do that. He is going to be that old school centre half. But that then freezes up with the left centre half and the right centre half. And in terms of what we can do now, I'm toying with the thing of sometimes in maybe in some games we have to go really solid if we're playing against a real physical side we may have to play three maybe classic center halves we may look at potentially I did say one of the fullbacks in the team that we have is pretty good very physical as well so he could do a job we might even look at bringing a fullback you know so a, so a technical fullback may work we may also look at bringing a central midfielder in playing in these wide areas these wide center back areas maybe a little bit fitter than that classic center half who maybe play that middle role someone who can potentially carry and play with the ball now they're not going to be ball playing defenders we're not going to be looking for those long sweeping passes but we do kind of want that Sheffield United wide center back role on both sides the DM's an interesting one. Basically there to hold on to the ball, not get too far forward. It, I think the role in terms of FM would change. Ideally at the start, I've put it as an anchor, but I think depending on the opponents and if we're dominating games, potentially looking at a register, a deep line playmaker, potentially. We don't do a halfback because we've got that back three in. I don't want to complicate the build-up with like a centre-half going into midfield and the, left, and the DM dropping off. So... Got to be technically good, but playing basic, being that important cog in rest defence, that will be our defensive midfielder. Two win backs, really aggressive. Highly likely these will be attacking players that are extremely fit. I'm not looking at trying to convert full backs into attacking players. I'd rather try and convert attacking players, wingers, wide players into wing backs. They will be extremely high in possession. They will occasionally have to drop in. So when we're without the ball in maybe our own half, we will drop into a really compact 3-5-2. So it's very important that they have the buy-in with it. You know, if we're trying to convert a right winger into a right wing back, that potentially might be an issue. And they've also got to have the physicality and the fitness. I think it'll be very important. Our substitutions, our subs that we have available to us, I think we can have three from five having at least one player who can go in and act as a wing back when these players inevitably will tire. The two central midfielders, I've swapped around with the rules a little bit in terms of FM, but I do want them to be two really aggressive, not ball winning eight, but great physicality, great, great dribbling for that standard, and then having the ability to break into the box. Box to box midfielders, central midfielders on attack if we're talking FM24. The two strikers, we're kind of going to go with two nines. Now, I do want one to be a, very much like a target forward, a target man on attack. Alongside a strike, alongside the classic number nine, I want them to drop, drop in at times. What we'll talk about, but also working channels, pinning the two centre halves. But we need a little bit of movement from one of the strikers. We often get two strikers if they're not of that physical profile. We still want one of them to drop in and create space for another striker or for a central midfielder to go into. So we need to get them working in tandem. Often strikers don't work together. In particular, the teams that I've watched the Workers too as very much individuals. When one goes short, one doesn't necessarily know when he needs to go in, and we need to get that right. I think once again it can work. It's just a couple of real simple, simple movements. I think there will be a lot of stuff, in particular before games. My idea would be to set up like this, 
before the away team arrives and do a lot of sort of like 11 versus zero shadow play and just do when this goes there, you need to drop in. When this goes there, you need to drop in and just set a couple of basic movements for those strikers to work on. Okay, so how would we build up in possession coming against, I'm going to show you 4-4-2 first and then a little bit out more out of possession and stuff with the 4-3-3, kind of covering both bases. A lot of the times we will play teams 4-4-2. So obviously we have that initial overload in the centre of the pitch with the goalkeeper as well. So we've kind of got a 4-V2. So we don't really need our DM and our wing-backs to really get involved in initial play of build-up. One of my non-negotiables will be that we don't have to build up, but we're always going to show like we're going to build up because what that might encourage is trying to bait the press that Brighton are trying to do often, where they keep the foot on the ball. The goalkeeper will have possession of the ball. We may even start... Now, we can't do it in FM, but we may start with one of our centre-halves starting with the goal kick and giving the ball to the goalkeeper and trying to bait a press out, maybe with the two strikers. So the first thing I want my two centre-halves to do is to drop off. Can they drop off into pretty much the six-yard line? Really short. In, I think in the day, we used to have them outside of the box, remember, if you wanted to build up from the back. And that meant that first pass out into sort of like the wide areas was really tricky. Something that encouraged a press a little bit more and was easier to press because of the passing distance between a goalkeeper and centre-half. So we can do that. And I think we can do this no problem. So we've dropped off. And it'd be interesting. At the moment, I'm unsure of what the strikers will do. And I've kind of given us two scenarios to give to our players of what we would do if the strikers jump or not jump. I think generally a lot of the time they will jump. There may be a point in games where they say, right, we're getting played around, we won't do it. So we need to come up with two scenarios if they do jump and press and when they don't. Then if the keeper does start with it, we've got three options. I'm quite happy to do a little bit if the centre half does come into the area. I'm quite happy to do a little bit of a bounce pass. Maybe he stands on the penalty spot as well, just to give us a little bit of a... A start, you know, it might be just into the centre half, bounce pass back to the goalkeeper or play out to our wider centre halves. And then just a couple of little passing moves. It may be a case of wing back dropping off, passing the ball to the wing back. And then the DM, you know, the DM's movements are going to be a lot of lateral movements from side to side. I really want him to be support. We want to create as many triangles on the pitch. You know, the amount of triangles we can potentially get on the pitch with this system is absolutely massive. We're not going to try, you know, a lot of teams at the moment are focused on wide diamonds. That's an extra player, an extra complication. But if we can get these little triangles in here, that will help us shift the ball up. You know, there'll be that press from the other team, but it'll be quite delayed and will give us the opportunity to maybe not do things one touch, but I think be able to do things two touch. And one thing that we'll have to focus on in these scenarios is body shape and where we pass the ball and passing the ball to the safe side. The amount of times that I see players giving the ball to a player but not thinking about how that player is then going to protect the ball. So that's something that we're definitely going to work on, passing the safe side of the of the defender. So just a couple of here that we could do. The goalkeeper, obviously if the two strikers look at pressing wide players, we could potentially just progress the ball through the middle with a centre half. But we're looking at working with a, one of the wider players, the DM, and a centre-back. And it might mean that the, the right wing-back starts really high and then drops in as, as the play starts. That could be a little thing we could play on. And then, generally, I would expect I'm going to get my two CMs to kind of move out of the way and take their two central midfielders out of the way. Can we get the DM going and get him free as much as possible? I do want that DM to be quite technically gifted at our level. Yes, defensively going to be okay. But if you think of Inter Milan, yeah, we're not Inter Milan, I know, but Hakan Chanaloglu is doing a tremendous job playing as a DM and sitting and holding because we want the ball ourselves. So having someone of the local level of Hakan Chanaloglu, someone who's really comfortable in possession of, once again, I've got an idea of a, a lad that could do it, no problem. Not the fittest, but tremendous ball player would definitely able to move that ball from side to side. So having these little movements to free up and then the DM is free and then we can exploit, you know, if a central midfielder comes out, we can we can then play around them and we've got that overload in the middle of the pitch here. As you can see, it would pretty much look like, what, a 5v4 five, a five in the centre of the pitch. Another option as well, depending on what we kind of notice the strikers are doing, we could get the left and the right centre half to kind of pull the strikers away a little bit if they kind of follow them into the wide areas. Can we play here? So can we play to the centre half? And once again, he could potentially turn and play to the DM. Can, you know, the goalkeeper would be more than comfortable playing a 20-yard pass. My only little worry is that that 
DM pass might be a little bit too long. So we'd have to be careful of getting, once again, getting those centre midfielders to take their centre midfielders away and really opening up that space in that third there. So there's a couple of little things that we would do maybe against a 4-4-2. How we would do it in a 4-3-3 would be a little bit different, or a 4-2-3-1. So, obviously, you would imagine them to go generally man for man. Um, not Once again, not quite sure what the wing-backs and the... Sorry, the two wingers would do for the opposing side. So, we're going to go on the basis that they're going to press high. So, an option would be, obviously, start the centre-halves in again. We're going to then have, potentially, the wing-backs free, open to receive a pass. I imagine the fullbacks will stay quite deep. So we'll get the, the wing backs on our side to drop in quite deep, not to not to then attract sort of like the interest from the fullback. Could we then do a simple pass where the left centre half into the left centre half, and then a quick pass, and then a quick pass out to the fullback either side as well? That could be an option. I would imagine if the ball goes to the left centre half, someone's gonna press us. And then can we exploit that space that they've left? As well, if they do decide to press high, what we could do is draw out the, the, the wingers, their wingers. And then our goalkeeper maybe even has the potential of drifting, lofting a ball out wide. If they're going to press us quite high and we maybe kind of suck them in, bait the press a little bit, maybe play our, our defenders in more wider areas, opens out the space to play it into a, a fullback, uh, one of our wingbacks, sorry. And then the next one could be a simple structure. Once again, looking at that 11 v 0 can we move the ball quickly to the left centre half? Can he move it into the midfielder who's potentially dropped in? Can he then play a little bounce pass, control, two touch? Can he pass it into a left fullback who's dropped off and then exploit that space because we've drawn out their right winger, their right wing back, their right fullback is probably going to then engage, come and press. You know, there's not normally a hold, let's hold our shape. It's always, can someone go and press the ball? And I would expect their right fullback in this scenario to come out and try and press the left wing back. And then that's when then we've opened out that space in behind for us to exploit. Now, if they sit more in a 4-5-1, or not, not so much a low block, but a four, we're going to say a 4-5-1, where they sit and kind of have two banks of four, we're obviously going to have that really aggressive overload at the start, pretty much a 4v1 if we include the goalkeeper. So, so a lot easier to build up from the back. But what we need to do is we need to kind of encourage and them to break that back, five, that back five, or that middle five, should I say. So how are we going to do that? Obviously, we'll play the ball. We imagine the centre forward will stay central. We'll mark that centre back. So he's just going to cover him. Play out to the left back or full back. And then you would imagine the striker will move across, will go and press. And what we'll do is we'll just shuffle it across and we'll take him out of the game. You know, the ball will then come into the centre half and then we'll play out the other way. Now the right back, we've worked it. I'm kind of thinking like uh, Bastonia in Milan where we've worked it and now he's got space to travel in. Teams will generally go man to man. So we're kind of covered in there. What we want then is the striker perhaps to drop in. So we said about that nearest striker. Like I don't know if it's going to be a target forward, but we want that target forward or deep line forward kind of movement where they drop in and create space. We don't want both of them hugging the touchdown. We've got to get them thinking a little bit unselfishly, rather of I'm not going to make a run that's going to suit me so I can get the ball. Is it so I can then create space for somebody else? And then what that would do is would hopefully allow space for a centre midfielder to get on his bike and exploit or a striker to come in behind and make that angled run. And then we hit that ball in that channel. Remember, we're not going to be able to do tiki taka through the thirds. We need to exploit space when we can. So very important that we just so it's very important that we disjoint and and move their defenders, move their fullbacks, move their centre backs and create space in behind. I don't want it to be like a back four. And as us having a front three or a front two just chasing and it being a race, we need to create that little bit of space so it gives us that advantage. Another one as well could be a little pass into the central midfielder, the DM coming round, dropping off, playing a pass back, and then quickly maybe playing a first time passing behind. That's a little bit more difficult. I do think our DM would be able to do that quickly. It would be a quick movement where the ball goes in. That's then a trigger for you to quickly come round. And we're looking at maybe a little layoff and then a pass. Once again, we've got the space to do it at home. Difficult when we play on some pitches away from home. Uh, there's some interesting pitches which you imagine at local level. So it might not be something we would be able to do on a regular basis. But it could be even just a little bounce pass. It could be a one-two. 
into the central midfield. He might even just bounce it back to the right centre half. And once again, we suck out that centre half. That's going to be the thing. Can we drag out that centre half and then we exploit that gap in between the centre half and the fullback? And then moving into sort of like the final third, we're going to try and create like a 3 1 6, which is very Girona style and quite popular. And we do need a few little movements. They're not going to be a flat six across there. There's going to be obviously people working in half spaces. We still want one of the strikers to drop in. But Basically, we're going to create this scenario where we can get the wide centre-halves on the ball and we're going to try and force wingers in a 4-4-2 all the way back. And we're going to do that, obviously, with our build-up, with a good rest defence. I'm hoping that we can recycle the ball pretty good. And it will hopefully end up looking something like this. And then what we're going to try and do is, once again, create a couple of simple movements. It's just that triangle with a central midfielder, one of the eight going wide, and then with our left wing-back or the right wing-back, been the option out wide. We've got the striker once again dropping off because we want to create that space in behind. And then what we're going to do is try and work the ball out wide. We've left space. Centre half's come out. Yes, the centre half. If the centre half doesn't follow, we're going to get that overload in the centre of the pitch so the ball can go straight into a striker who can maybe turn and run. But we want to create that space for a ball to go in, preferably on the ground. I want balls generally to be at a height where we're not having to head. It might even be a chest and, chest and hit. But not a long high ball into the box. And what this does then creates a little bit of space. Can the central midfielder move into it? Can the striker move round? This right striker, can he move into the space? And even can the center, the striker that's then come out, can he then turn and move into it? And we, once again, we're creating space and we're going to exploit these spaces on either side. So now you've got obviously the central midfielder run. And then if they do come and press and the right winger comes and presses us and we're kind of set and no one's disjointed, then what we, ha what we do have is the defensive midfielder and he's going to be really key. And this is where we want him. In and around that sort of like box 14 area at the edge of the area, we're hoping in the 4-4-2 he's going to be a free lot. And that will help us recycle possession and we might shift the ball from side to side. But I'm quite comfortable for him to be really aggressive in this, uh, in this instance. Can he then get the ball and drive into the area? We'll pull someone out and it's more of pulling their back line out whenever we can. We'll still maybe perhaps get a striker to drop, but if they are staying quite defensive and quite low, then we'll definitely use our defensive midfielder more of a, a deeper creator. Obviously, we need a good rest defence. I'm always worried about defenders not doing their job, so I would like one of the left centre-halves to get involved a little bit. I'm not sure I'm, how we're going to run that if we go with maybe a left centre half potentially standing in front of that striker. And if the ball comes out, then because the DM's gone, we need the left centre half or one of the centre halves to go in. I'm not sure about that. I think that will be stuff that will have to change in game, depending on how we're playing, depending on what how we're breaking down teams, how much we're having to rely on that defensive midfielder in terms of build. I would prefer him just to sit and not really touch the ball in terms of attacking play. I'd rather him just sit and maybe recycle possession, win second balls, keep that possession, keep the pressure on the opponents. That is kind of the final third stuff. There's going to be a lot of individual stuff you would hope from our strikers. I said it's really easy to more talk about the out of possession stuff and to work on that rather than in position. You know, you're relying on your, your, your creative players. We'll create the structure. We'll get our strikers, them simple movements. We'll get our central midfielders working those half spaces, being quite aggressive, running into the box, running into channels, balls into the box. How we're going to do that using the defensive midfielders when we can. But generally, that will be left to the attacking players to be creative in their own in their own way. We're not going to be able to kind of improve them at a, a higher level in terms of their technical ability. So just a couple of movements, a couple of little patterns might just help us and let them know and, and, and let the players know what we're trying to exploit. So our possession, we're going to look at playing against the 4-3-3 first and how are we going to do it with their build-up? Now, I'm not sure how often this is going to happen. Goalkeepers often go long, but what we are going to try and do is we're going to set some pressing traps. So I'm going to get my two strikers to kind of be the only players in that attacking third. Remember, we've got those red lines that I've talked about and that will be a, a starting point for us all. We're going to have the team squeezed quite high. And what we're going to try and do is encourage the goalkeeper to kick, kick it short, play it short. Now, obviously, if it goes long, we can't do much about it. We're going to make sure that we're nice and compact, as we spoke about. But what we're going to try and do is encourage the ball to go to the centre half. We're not going to press that centre half. We're going to remember we talked about the, the technical qualities of sometimes fullbacks. Also, teams, even though we're outnumbered a little bit out wide because of that pendulum effect that we spoke about at the start, we can move across and we can cut out the line pass. So... 
we're going to use that defensive line as a bit of a trigger as well. It's an extra defender is the touch line. So we're going to force that ball out to the fullback and then we're going to press. Now it's a case of who's going to press. And in this, and then playing against this 4-3-3, I really want the left wing back to go and press the full back. I want us to be, as you can see, really nice and compact. We're not going to worry about, you know, if the ball goes back to the goalkeeper and it's shifted out the same side, we're going to shift. But I really want our right wing back to be engaged and play. Don't worry about what's going on with their left winger. We're going to probably deal with that. If he wants to stay, obviously we've got the left winger here quite central. If he decides to stay out right out on that left hand side, then so be it. He can go out on that left-hand side and we'll deal with that. You know, we're not going to... Generally, there will probably be a goal during the season that we'll concede where a ball is switched by the right back and it goes out to the left winger and he goes and scores. But generally, that will not happen. So we're going to leave him out there. We want to be nice and compact. And then what we are going to do is go and press with the left wing back. We want the two strikers working together. We're going to shuffle across, as we said. So like the left centre half is now looking like a left back. We've got the back three in. And then the wing rack, I'm not that bothered at the moment about bringing him in. We may have to at some point, but I'd rather him tuck in to make a little bit of a 3-4-3 three, three out of possession with the with the press. We may, as I said, with that pendulum, there'll be at times in particular when we're playing, defending in the final third, we may have to bring him back in and we'll we'll speak about that more in sort of like deeper, sort of like in deeper opposition build-up. But the left backs, but the left wing backs going in. The two strikers are doing an important job. They're going to stop that easy pass, maybe back to the goalkeeper. That would be good. So if the striker can hover around and stop that backward pass, that would be brilliant. And then the striker's got a difficult job. So as you can see, generally everywhere else, we're going man to man. I may attract one of the central midfielders out, but what I do want is that central striker to really be a cover shadow for that deeper midfielder. Yes, the central midfielder might come in and mark, but we want to stop that easy pass into him so he can control it, with, even though with his back to goal, but we want to stop that. We really want to force that player wide and really limit the amount of options that they have. Everyone else on the pitch will go man to man. We'll leave the wide left back obviously free and we'll press. So that's going to be interesting if I can get that striker to be not, yeah, to be aware of that, maybe that deep line mid, play, mid, midfield, not playmaker, but midfielder. Teams sometimes do play a basic flat 4 3 3, which then would mean we'll go right really aggressive in terms of our man to man press. And Yes, we've spoke about a man-to-man -man press in the opposition, but our man-to-man -man press would be a lot more structured, a lot more practiced. They're going to be really aggressive, really tight. No fouls. We're going to let them make the mistakes, playing with their back to goal. From this instance then, from this instance then, I imagine the right back would probably go long. You know, there's not going to be much in terms of build. If he decides to play inside, absolutely brilliant because we've got that overload in there. We're really tight and really aggressive and then we'll break ourselves and counter-attack. The 4-4-2 is a little bit different and we're going to have to then use our strikers, I think, a little bit more. Depending on what the wing backs do, the, depending on what the wingers do, I think we're going to do the same thing where we're going to encourage that ball to go out to the fullback and our two strikers then will go and press. So the striker, one of the strikers will go and press the fullback. The other striker will then come in and support, stop that, potentially that ball going backwards. We want to force that ball down the line. I imagine the left wing back will be a little bit deeper might even look like a flat five at times, depending on how high their wingers go, but we'll do that. I think it's important to go man for man, so the two wider centre-halves maybe mark the strikers, and having our, one of our defenders free, hopefully our backup defender or even one of the wide centre-halves, who can maybe cover it if a ball's going in behind. Our goalkeeper will be extremely attacking. He, like, stands on the edge of his area, so hopefully we can sweep up long balls. But we may get this scenario here where, we once again, we move across... The left winger will probably tuck in a little bit and the right winger will and our right wing back will tuck in and we'll make another back four. That pendulum effect once again with our wing back tucking in and our left back going and pressing, being really tight to their right winger. Once again, we've got that overload in midfield. I'd pr probably prefer my DM to be quite deep. Can we force the ball potentially into the central midfield at times? I think what I'll try and get my strikers to do is probably cut that option out and we'll get them to play down the line. But there will be times that we don't cover that space enough and the ball will come inside. So if that's the case, we have got a 3v2 in there ready to pounce. Now, I do expect teams to kind of do the Eric Ten Hag. We'll do it for a little bit. 
and then we've lost two goals against Brentford, so we'll just start kicking it long. I imagine that will happen a lot. So that's why that compactness of our team would be super important. I do also think if teams are going long, having three centre-halves as well, really key in winning those duels when balls are played, then 50-50 balls are played up, and then a really important job of our defensive midfielder to try and pick up those second balls. And then when we're defending deeper, it's important we're going to get that pendulum effect in. So as you can see, we're playing up against a 4-4-2 at the moment. The right wing back's tucked in, makes the back four. We're going to expect the left wing back to come out and press maybe a full back. And then what we've got is our defenders moving across, defenders moving across to make that back four really compact. The, the key thing that I want to really focus on is a bit like our what you would call our rest attack with our two strikers and how we're going to transition and making sure that when we do win the ball, our first option is just not to kick it long and to chase the channel straight away. So I want in my centre, my two strikers to help out. I want them potentially to drop off a little bit because we want to exploit this area here when we do win the ball. So compactness is going to be key. Forced to play out wide like we did in the uh, sort of like the deeper press, so the well, sorry, the more advanced pressing. Keeping that midfield really tight, no space, no space for them to attack down the middle. We want them going down the line because I don't think the quality of chance that they'll create out wide is going to be key. We're going to have three defenders in there, probably even four defenders in there. And at the same time as well, one of our non-negotiables will be we stop crosses. It's a very an old school approach, um, but I think having our wing backs, centre halves, whoever goes into these wide areas, stopping balls coming into the box will be an absolutely key part of our game. Getting that ball, keeping that ball out of our box. Okay, so we want to exploit this this bit. So we want to exploit this here. So we're asking our strikers just to drop in a little bit. Can they drop in? Their two their centre halves will either do two things. They will either they will either drop off or obviously will go in really tight. And we can work around that either way. If it is a case that they've come really high and pressed, they're leaving that space in behind. So it might be when we win the ball, can our free man, the defensive midfielder, be the key? He's going to be the absolutely key part when we win the ball. Can he get the ball and then play? And it might be a case of, remember I said about securing the ball at the start? We want to make sure that we get a couple of passes in. So it might just be, if the left back wins it, it might just be a simple, it might open up that he can do a clipped ball in behind. The, the right back might be out of the game, might be on the floor and we can drive and we can dribble. But what we're going to try and do is make sure our defensive midfielder or one of the spare midfielders is able to get on the ball and then that second pass then can be put in behind for our two strikers to chase. And if they don't press, often might stay on that halfway line. One may come in and press and it might leave that one of our strikers is free. And then once again, we've got that easy bounce pass, a nice simple pass, hopefully into the one of the strikers who can either turn, you know, if the centre half doesn't follow him, he can turn and drive, turn and dribble, play a ball in. And then we attack, as I said, in numbers. That's going to be something really important that we're going to really focus on. It will help with our minimum width as well, that we don't get caught too much in transitions. We're going to be quite narrow. Players close to each other. Can we find that free man? Strikers will make a, a, make a move. It may be a case of the two strikers move across. One sort of like runs to the touchline. One drops in. One long, one wide. High and wide and then short and narrow. We may look at kind of that kind of basic structure. A little bit of work to do with the strikers, but it's all basic. One drops in, one goes long, one goes wide, one comes in. It's going to be stuff that I think we can work on. Pre-season will be massive. If anyone wants to know about pre-season, my motto with pre-season was always we would train once a week and we would play once a week. Sometimes we would play two in a week. We're trying to get games because of cricket and other scenarios. People can't play and had farmers that couldn't play uh, Saturday games, could play with night games. I'd try and get in a load of friendlies. We would start early, maybe eight. We would have maybe eight, ten friendlies where we can work on this. Obviously, there'll be a lot of 11 against zero shadow play kind of stuff. Um, which the lads will find terribly boring. So it'll be important to try and not overdo that. I, my plan would actually would do that on match day. Normal time turning up would be one o'clock an hour before the game. So maybe we turn up half an hour, 45 minutes earlier and get a little bit of the boring stuff in or the match stuff that we're trying to focus on on that day. You know, it might be a case of this is how we're going to build up today. Uh, this is how we, you know, if we know our team's going to probably go 4-4-2, this is how we're going to do things. This is how we're going to maybe work on set pieces. And then in set pieces in particular, well, I'll just show you when we set up the set pieces in the game, how I would do it. It's quite basic. There's not going to be no clear runs. We may do a, often a little short one where we, we cross from a deeper area, but generally we're just going to focus on getting the big guys in right areas, defending well, defending deep. We're not going to keep players up on the halfway line to try and counter-attack the amount of goals. There was an interesting interview 
uh, with the amount of counter-attacking goals. I think it was Paul Warren, who was manager of Rotherham at the time. Um, I might even leave a little link to that interview down in the description where he was talking about the amount of goals that are scored from counter-attacks. Absolutely zero. Let's keep the def our attackers back. So it really be defending our box, making sure we're defending rather than focusing on attacking, especially when there's sort of like when defending set pieces, corners, etc. So that is a huge part of the game. Um, how does it look? in FM24. Right everyone, so moving into part two of the video, it's all FM and how the tactic is put together in Football Manager, how it looks in Football Manager and how it is done. Now I normally do my tactical replications, a bit like Stinger. I'd normally do them with Inter Milan and today is no different. Obviously salute to 3-5-2, probably the most popular 3-5-2 team at the moment, Inter Milan. The season has gone Tremendously well. Now, what I have done is I played the first 10 games full through some extended highlights, and then I've been doing instant result so I could then alter and rotate players around just so there wasn't a like a go on holiday kind of thing. And I've done that and we've managed to win the City A. 91 points. We lost the last game of the season. 107 goals scored with only 32 against. Remember, this video was about my real life blueprint, not so much trying to make something that works in the game. So I'm really chuffed because I've done. Plenty of seasons with Inter Milan this year, and I've not always won the league. So obviously it works. I didn't tweak anything tactically. I just played the blueprint. The tactic is available now for the Patreons. Link down in the description. Muchly appreciate it if you go check that out, if you want to get the tactic download. I am going to go through all the tactical information, all the player roles, etc. So you can copy it in yourself. But if you want to support the channel, and that would then potentially then help me move into managing the football team again, hey, That'd be great. Okay, so champions, we got knocked out by Manchester City, which was really frustrating because we won the first leg at home 4-2 and I thought, aye, aye, we're in for a big shock here. We'd absolutely drawn them as well in the Champions League group. So I was disappointed to draw them. And then they absolutely wiped the floor with us. In extra time, though, we got Bastoni sent off. Taram opened the scoring. And yeah, we were 5-2 up and still managed to go out 7-5 on aggregate. The league season itself, though, Really good. We just had a couple of absolute stinkers. Like losing to Lazio away is no like great shame. Bologna was the weird one. They did quite well actually in the season, Bologna. And we were in the midst of a, a decent run and they absolutely wiped the four of us. But we responded quite well in the next game, winning 7-0 against Empoli. And then we had another shocker against Paranthorpe, uh, Napoli, which once again responded pretty well the game after with a seven uh, with a seven one victory over Hellas Verona, a Napoli side that as a Napoli side as well that weren't you know they finished seventh and so not a great season for them. A three two defeat against Sassuolo. I think this was in and around the Champions League. We were doing a lot of rotation. Yeah, there's some players in there, a Serbi. So a little bit of disappointment with that one, but once again we responded again. Six one win over Lazio after the defeat against Sassuolo, and then last game of the season. Atalanta got their payback, their revenge, because we did beat Atalanta to win the Coppa Italia. Really good victories, really good two-leggers over Lazio. 3-1 win against Atalanta. Let's see the goals. So DeMarco down the left, low cross, like the low crossing guys, if you're into anything in FM-wise, like the reason why I'm wanting to do low crosses is because of the quality of the delivery that we might get at local league standard as amateur standard. And then obviously a header is harder than a, a, a finish, obviously with the feet along the ground. So that's why I've done low crosses and it's worked tremendously well with Lataro. Obviously Taram's a bit bigger, but both of them scored an absolute hatful with those goals in the penalty area. Really low cut crosses in around sort of like the six yard box. And as well, look, three players in the box. We've got Mkhitaryan centre midfielder on attack, Barella on the edge. I would like Dumfries to get in there. A little bit of a frustration because he does have the time, I think. Does he? Maybe. Bring it back a little bit. Because that's the thing. I want wing, them wing-back to wing-back goals is what we love. And he kind of just hovers. Ideally, I would like him being the guy at the front post. I want one striker as we're in again to run like quick vertical passes, what we're absolutely all about. Quick transition, good burst from DiMarco, pressing, pass, and in, exploiting the gap, left down that left channel, really impressive. And then it was a set piece, second phase, different, yeah, second phase. 
we'll take that. But what I was saying about the wing back, I ideally want one of the strikers, we keep it basic again, one of the strikers to go to the near post, one hit in the penalty area, and then I want that right wing back or the left wing back from whichever side it is. I want them coming in and getting a, hopefully a tap in at the far post. That's what I want to see. That's what I'd be expecting my wing backs to do. We also won the Super Copa as well, but very quickly, I'll just show you some of the season stats. 39 goals for Lataro, 35 goals for Taram. Hakan Chanaloglu playing as the anchor, managed to get 12 goals and 12 assists, 12 assists. A lot of sort of like set pieces, penalties, uh, second phases from corners. Denzel Dumfries, and we'll have a look at 24 assists from DiMarco and 19 assists from Denzel Dumfries, which is not bad considering of the way I'm asking my team to play in terms of the focus of possession. Right, let's get into it. My blueprint 352 tactic. And here it is. So. Sweeper keeper on attack. Remember I said we've got that keeper who is pretty decent on the ball. We want him to be the Anana at Inter Milan kind of coming out and helping him build up and being very positive in terms of potentially switching balls out to the full back, sorry, the wing back. So that's why we've got that on sweeper keeper on attack. Moving across to the wide, two wide centre backs, both at the moment on support with the player instruction of dribble more. Because we want, as I said, we want to break lines when we can. If we're playing against low blocks sometimes or we're playing against maybe a front three or a 4-5-1, or I'm going to need my wide centre-backs to really drive with the ball and that will then push up our wing-backs. If we have our wide centre-backs moving in, it's naturally going to move our, our wing-backs up the pitch and that's exactly what we want. I will probably occasionally, <clears throat> probably depending on the personnel of the team and the opponents, we may often change that to a defence and then at certain points in games, I think, especially when we're maybe playing against a 4-5-1, I might even, you know, put one of them even on attack and get them being so aggressive on one of the sides to really force the play and try and bait out maybe a press against a low block. We'll still have two defender, two covering defenders in the other wide centre-back. So that's a, lot, that's a potential change that we tweaks in game that we may make. But right now, wide centre-back on support both sides. The middle defender, remember, we wanted that, as I said, that kind of old school defender. So we've gone central defender on cover because we want to just cover any, you know, we don't want that flat back three. We want a little bit of depth in the team and also it helps with build up a little bit as well. So we've got pass it shorter for him because I want him to be really simple. I don't want him hoying it into the channels. I want him to pass to the two wide centre halves. I want him to pass to that anchor man there, really. And the goalkeeper is in the middle of that diamond there, as you can see. So that's what I want with take fewer risks as well. So he's been really careful in possession, making as we're trying to limit. Obviously, I'm not expecting him to be a really good ball player. It might be, I said, maybe an older player, player with a bit more experience who maybe is, yeah, along those lines of those old school defenders that we get at local league, but is very good at just doing the simple things and doing it on a regular, regular occurrence. So that's why I've got those instructions in. Right, the two wing backs, very similar, both exactly the same. Wing backs on attack. Remember, we want to try and create that at least. That's sort of like 3-2-5 or 3-1-6 at times. They're going to be our width. We want them pinning back those fullbacks as much as we can. And we've also got Mark Tighter on as a player instruction for both sides. The reason why we've done that is because we want them to really press and be involved in those trigger presses and then them trigger and then pressing traps that we're going to set up. So having them marked tighter and being really aggressive, maybe on wingers and even fullbacks at times, that's why I've got that on. And then moving into the number six, I said we've gone for that anchor role with ease off tackles. And as I said, depending on the opponent, I don't really want a deep line playmaker. Um, it can't be a halfback. I do want him to play with the ball a little bit. I'm not actually expecting him to be too creative. We have seen at times the anchor sort of like playing balls into channels. But I have done a player instruction of ease off tackles. And the reason why I've done that is because ease off tackles ask players to consider the ramifications of an aggressive mistimed tackle. Instead, will encourage them to pick their moments. So basically, I'm just making sure that he doesn't dive into tackles and get himself taken out of the game. I'm really conscious that if there's a counter-attack, if he if he's out of the way, he's gone and pressed too quickly and gone and dived in, we're gonna be our back three is gonna be exposed. And I really want him to be the anchor. Um at times I haven't changed it in the in the season that I did with Inter, but there is a thing that because of the player that I kind of have in mind and the play and the kind of player that I want, I don't want you to think an anchor is in an absolute, you know, water carrier kind of uh, makalele. I want that that anchor to be someone who can 
can break up play a little bit, but have the quality to keep things ticking. Remember, he's going to be reliant on not so much being the creator, but being the ticker where he gets the ball, he, he gets the ball off the goalkeepers that we set off in build up and get the balls in these sort of like wider triangles or diamonds if we've got a wide centre back, a, a wing back him and then maybe a central midfielder or even one of the strikers coming in to make a diamond. So, yeah, that's one of the reasons why we've gone with an anchor. Maybe a register, if we're playing against a team with a really low block, a register would be absolutely superb, especially for the Inter Milan and Hakan Chanaloglu. So, quite comfortable, depending on opponents, etc., to change that up to a register. Moving into the middle two, we've gone box-to-box midfielder. I've got him stay wider and tackle harder. I want the two eights to be really aggressive. Remember, we want them to be in these half spaces. So that's why I've got stay wider on and obviously tackle harder because I really want them being aggressive in that counter press. And on the left hand side, just someone who's going to get forward a little ball. I want him to be a real driver, not so much a creator, but someone because we're playing on this really big pitch that we have the 3G pitch, I really need at times a ball carrier from middle. So I want that guy to be someone who's confident enough to get it. He's got the opportunity. He's going to drive forward at the same time, staying wider in possession, helping out the wing backs as well with they'll stay wider because they can get a little bit isolated. So just a little bit of an option to maybe pull the ball inside. And then obviously once again, tackle harder because we want them to be so aggressive out of possession. Into the front two, this could be a deep line forward. Obviously, the, the target forward is very much based on personnel. And, you know, the guy that will have to be target forward me would have to be six foot plus and can run a little bit. So, you know, that is a little bit of a niche, a niche one at local level, a target forward who can run. But in an ideal world, it would be a target forward, someone who can lead the, bot, lead the line. And I've got moving to channels. I said, I don't want him to be like the John Parkin. I want him to be really fluent in his movement and helping, you know, we get to break so good because these players are an option in the wide areas. And it's the same with the other side. We want, obviously, the advanced forward will do it. Now, we don't want the advanced forward having to do both sides. We want to be able to take it in turns to work the channels and then the other one can hit the box. The advanced forward, no player instructions for him. Just the bog standard, number nine. Probably a little bit of pace can find the back of the net. Right, we've got positive mentality. Right, the in possession, we've gone attacking width fairly narrow. Remember, we want to be, we're trying to not force the ball through the middle, but we're looking at having that overload in there with the three centre half, the three midfielders, the two strikers. So a lot of our time, especially when we're playing on that big pitch, we've got to have a little bit of space still to play through the centre of the pitch. So that's what we're going to do. So we want also as well with the fairly narrow. Now, even though we're in talking about the in possession stuff, the fairly narrow is going to help us with our transitions our counter-pressing and enabling us to uh, re react. Remember, I said one of the key things when we lose the ball is how a team reacts. And normally at our standards, local standards, it can be quite poor as a team. I said individually it works quite well. So to counteract that and to make it a little bit easier for us to react better, if we can keep minimum width, one of those Red Bull kind of styles where we're not overly wet, overly wide. We'll have the if the ball's on the left, I'm quite happy for the wing back to be kind of tucked in that like sort of like that half space rather than staying out wide. Then it makes it a lot easier to counter press. So that's why we've got fairly narrow on passing to space. Yes, we want to be direct. I really want to see those strikers sort of like moving into channels. I want to see balls played for a central midfielder or a wing back to move into slightly more direct passing. Remember, we're not ticky tacky in because I think. We tried, I've seen teams try and do it and my old team tried to do it after I'd left and it was so slow and they did three or four passes and as I said, there's the possession standards are generally okay for them to progress up the pitch and once there's a little bit of pressure, they tend to know it only takes a bad touch, half a bad pass and they've lost the ball. So we're quite clear on having those two strikers as well. Can we get the ball forward in them? Can we pull out of maybe a fullback and exploit them spaces? in behind higher tempo yes i think it's a natural thing at local level to be all blood and guts and thunder you know the slow patient tempo is not going to suit local level it's going to be especially when we play on ship pitches i'm going to expect us to probably play even a little bit more direct at times really squeeze and be really aggressive in possession and then it's time wasted sometimes i think it's going to be important for us just to take a breather have a rest play the game a little bit carefully when we can especially when we get our noses in 
front. And all the other stuff, oh, sorry, final third, low crosses. Not of an over-reliance on hitting the crosses earlier. Don't need that. We want our wing backs getting nice and, high, nice and high and cutting the ball back. Play for set pieces, I've left off. However, if it turns out that we've got a real physical side, like the two eights, two strikers, three set halves, then we would definitely play for set pieces. Everything else is left off. In transition, counter press, yes. Remember we said we want that reaction of squeezing. I think that's very important. Luckily, we said we get it individually anyway. We're generally when a person loses possession of the ball. Nine times out of ten, they're really keen to get it back, but we want to do it as a group. So we're going to counter press, and then we're definitely going to counter, especially with those two strikers and those little couple of little spaces that we might leave with fullbacks. We really want to exploit those wide areas where fullbacks have maybe moved up in possession. Goalkeeper, he is a sweeper keeper on attack, so he'll naturally go along at times, but when we can, we want to build with that back three. We've got that back three in there for a reason in possession. We've got that natural overload, either a 3v1 if they're playing with a 4-3v or 4-5-1, or a 3v2 if, if they're playing a 4-4-2. We've also got the goalkeeper in there to add as maybe a 4v2 or a, even a, a 4v3, depending on what they're doing. Out of possession, there you go, mid-block. So he's done quite well, a mid-block in FM. Remember, what I want it to be compact. The goalkeeper, once again, I keep mentioning, really good off his line. He always has a really high, he's quite aggressive. But he, he, he does remind us that sweeper keeper will sit on the edge of his box, edge of his D, and will come out and sweep up most things. So high line, mid block, slightly more often trigger press. I've just left that standard. I've said we're trying to create that mid block. I'm really going to be keen on trying to get the two strikers to be clever in their runs and not to chase for 90 minutes. All right, they're going to pick and we're going to force that ball out wide, as we said. Step up more. I want us to be really aggressive when we can. Can we camp in that opponent's half? I, I do think... Generally, teams will struggle if we can really force the play and camp teams in. Very much like, you know, you've seen Manchester City, Inter Milan have done it very well recently where they're really camped in that opponent's half. If we've got the opportunity to do that, we will definitely do that and make it really hard for them. They're going to counter. They're going to have to counter from the edge of their own box rather than sort of like 40, 50 yards out from their own goal. Trap outside. Yes, we said we're going to force. I'm going to show you how I'm going to set up the uh, trigger presses in a minute. Trigger presses, so we are to trap outside, force that play outside, use the touchline as an extra defender. And a little bit of one of those non-negotiables that I think, very important, I think some teams invite crosses into the box. Yes, we've got them three centre-halves, but I do want to have a little bit of a pride in our wing-backs defending it and our centre-half defender or even midfielders or strikers. We don't let that ball come into the box. Very rarely will a team at our level... If a cross is about to come in, turn and then recycle and go out the other way. It doesn't happen that much. They're normally quite direct. If they want to put a cross in, they will try. So we're going to try and stop that at source and not allow balls to come into our box. Right, the opposition instructions. This is what we're going to do. Work with it together. Now, what we are going to do generally is never trigger press the goalkeeper. I don't want that at all. We are, however, going to trigger press the right back. And we're also going to trigger press the left back. We're not going to trigger press the defenders. Obviously, there may be an occasion where we come... I haven't really spoke against playing a 3-5-2 because I've not seen any teams do it. So if that scenario does come along, we'll have to think of another pressing way. We once again would probably sit off and force their ball out wide where we've got those 1v1s and shuttle the player one side. And I think that's what we would probably do. And I think it would help our strikers, our wing backs, our midfielders, if we know that we're always going to shuffle and try and force the play out and wide rather than saying, right, we're going to press centre-halves, try and keep it as simple as possible. OK, so trigger press, trigger press, trigger press. Show onto foot. I want to keep him on his, the right back on his right foot because he might be a left footer on that side, but we want him to focus, not coming back inside. I do want him to hit that line and away from our central line. And I know I've said that we've got that overload in the middle of the pitch, but I do want to force him down the line as much as we can. Nine times out of ten, they'll hit a long ball in the channel, and we're going to be able to cover that because we're prepped defensively with our pendulum effect, remember, with our centre-halves and, and with our centre left centre-half coming across if it's on that left-hand side. So that's what I would do. Show on to foot. And then what we may do is, depending on what they're doing in the midfield, if it's a two-man midfield, we probably would do a tight marking on those, the two central midfielders. I would probably do it all, actually, depending on what they're doing. In particular, the DM and definitely a trigger press when that ball goes in there. If it does come a centre-half into a central midfielder, because we've not covered it properly, they would absolutely want us to go and press on that. The attacking players, once again, 
even if they're right footed on the right hand side, I would still want to force them wide. So let's just say they're playing like with a, a, a strike. A, a, let's just say they're playing with a, a attacking right with a right footer. I'd probably keep him on the right and that'll force him down the line. I'm quite happy to force teams down the line. If he does get across, we'll hopefully have three centre halves in there to deal with it. Don't really want him cutting inside. I want to show teams down the line. So that's what I would probably do. And then if we're playing with a two-man striker force, strike force, I want us to be really aggressive. So I would definitely tight mark. And as I said, remember what I said at the start, things that I'd noticed, noticed from local football. A lot of decent strikers do sometimes struggle. In particular, when it's a lone striker, do struggle when they've got a defender really tight. So if we've got the opportunity to be really aggressive, either against two strikers and the middle defender dropping off, or it might even mean the middle defender going in and engaging with that cent lone central striker, then I'm more than happy to do that. Right, and last little thing, we're going to move into the set pieces. It's still a principle of play, and I'm just going to keep it so basic and just show you. So we're going to use like the setup routine that you get at the start of the season. So moving into the defensive strategy, I'm a little bit tied between the two. I would probably start with a little bit of a hybrid one. What we used to do back in the day, we used to have a defender that was six foot three, really big, really, really physical, really good in the air, would head everything. And we used to go a little bit of a hybrid with a couple of defensive areas done. So we used to have a line of three. We used to have both posts covered, a line of three. And then we used to leave him free. We used to bring back the strikers. He didn't do the zone and he didn't do a man. He just started running around the six yard box and just tried to attack it regardless. It was so successful. I can't get it obviously to work. I think for now, because we might not have that profile, I probably would do a little bit of a hybrid where we would have a line of three post met and then the rest would mark and I would bring back the strikers. So we'll go hybrid, both posts, and then we would go defend the box. Said there's that video about Paul Warren. Is it Paul Warren? Not Shane Warren, definitely Paul Warren. The uh, ex, now Derby manager was at Rotherham. He had fans moaning that he was bringing too many players back for corners. Like, we're not going to, we, even though we want to counter-attack, I want it just to be really condensed and attack and defend that box. How do you prefer the ball to be delivered from attacking set pieces? It's going to be difficult because of the quality that we may have from set pieces, but what I am going to do is go near post. We'll create a couple of little bit of routines. I, what I was planning of doing is just getting my big guy, my biggest guy, to be in and around it and see if he can either attack it to nod it in or even just to help it on so we can get maybe a flick on and then someone tapping in with that second ball maybe at the back stick. So that's what I would do. And then once again, we would be aggressive the other way around. I think the chances of a team countering against us regularly over the course of the season is really low. So we would go pros, more pressure on the opposition defence, more chance of winning the second ball, which is crucial, more exposed to counter-attacks. But you do need, with counter-attacks, you do need that quality, especially from a corner. You know, you're going to need two or three really good passes probably from get from one end to the other. Are the opponents at a lower league going to be able to do that, especially when it's defending their own box? Potentially not. So we'll be really aggressive, see if we can get people for second balls in around the outside. One of the cons as well is requires quick recovery runs from our defenders. Obviously, we would make sure that in and around the area, we'd have players probably with pace or wing backs, potentially a striker, depending on the height. If it's an advanced forward who's maybe only five foot nine, five foot eight, highly likely he'll be pulled out of the box because he's not going to be much of a threat with balls going into the penalty area. And then this one's a little bit awkward because it needs to be an in-swinger out. So I would prefer an in-swinger if we're imagining that near post ball with a, with a defender on it. I would prefer him being able to help it on a little bit more naturally with an in-swinger rather because if it's an outward swinger, he's going to have to adjust his body to kind of flick it to the back stick or flick it in. So I'd prefer it to be an in-swinger so he can kind of just help it on its way. All right, that is it. I really hope you've enjoyed it. It's been, as I said, a long time in planning and thinking and tweaking and changing them. And hopefully it comes across as something that you've enjoyed and you know, never you never know, one day I may be able to implement this into a team. And if that is the case and the Patreon and the channel keeps growing and I make that decision to go back in, I will hopefully definitely hopefully definitely share my kind of my journey and my tactical things will be the idea will be trying to get that little bit of equipment that we can video games and stuff. But it's something that I really want to do at some point in the future. All right, guys, thank you very much for watching. Smash the like on today's video and uh, yeah, we'll see you later. Cheers, guys.